Jay is uh, the first vice president for the Hamilton District Labor Council. She sits as a board member of the United Way of Holton and Hamilton. She is a founding member of the Women's March Hamilton. She's a mother of six young women, a long-term care RPN, and a member of SEIU Healthcare. She will be our moderator for tonight's panel, and we welcome her to introduce our guests and begin the discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining our Labor Council session on the myths and misconceptions and mission. Um, so I'm going to keep this tight. We all know uh, from everything in the media how much we have heard about long-term care. And so we want to talk about where we were, where we are, and what's going to happen or potentially what can be done uh, in the future. And so the, I want to get right into it. Um, I want to first introduce uh, Charlene Stewart. Charlene has been the president of SEI Healthcare since 2003, and she has spent decades amplifying the voices of healthcare workers and advocating for equality, respect, and dignity. During COVID-19, Charlene has been one of the strongest voices in the media, demanding immediate solutions to the issues frontline workers and the public have faced in our healthcare system. As a mother and a grandmother, Charlene understands the importance of creating innovative and sustainable solutions that not only benefit today's worker, but future generations as well. Welcome, Charlene. Uh, Michael Hurley, our next panelist, has been the president of the Ontario Council of Hospital Unions since 1990 and is the first vice president of CUPE Ontario. He has been a vocal advocate across the province advocating for health care standards and improving working conditions for his 35,000 working at 120 hospital sites and long-term care facilities. During the pandemic, he has taken every effort to ensure the provincial government answers for its continued mismanagement of long-term long -term and healthcare in general. Welcome, Michael, and we thank you so much uh, for coming on. Um, we're gonna start right into our questions so our, um, our panelists can, uh, we can get on this. And so if there's anybody that has questions, please, again, just put it through the chat. And we want to make this as interactive as possible. So near the end of, or the last 10, 15 minutes, we will get to as many of the questions for our panelists. So please, if you're starting to get questions, start to think about them, start uh, sending them out to us. So our first question I'll send, I'll pose to Charlene. Um, so if, Charlene, if you could tell us a bit of your workers, your union, and what do people misunderstand about what your members do in long-term care? Sorry, Charlene, the unmuting isn't working. Would you mind trying it from your end? Can you hear me now? Perfect. Okay, so I'll start all over again. <laughs> so I just want to say thank you, Jay Ode. It's an honor to be here with you this evening. And I just want to say it's nice to see you again. It's nice to be sharing some time with you. Uh, I miss you. Uh, you were a great member leader at SEIU and uh, just a shout out to your leadership on the Hamilton District Labor Council. And I, I want to thank you for hosting this important discussion tonight uh, and also for the Hamilton District Labor Council's contributions to the committee hearings that we had on Bill 175 this week. It's so important that we all raise our collective voices so that families know the choice our government is making when it comes to further privatizing our healthcare system and further exploiting home care services and the workers. So thank you for that. And uh, I wanna thank Michael Hurley too for being uh, such a real partner and brother in the, in the trenches during this pandemic. It's been unprecedented times for labor, for workers all across the province. And we've been working very closely over the last few months, uh, struggling with what's been going on in long-term care, but also community and hospital and uh, other essential services. So Michael, it's been great. We, we've already were allies in the fight for better healthcare, but it means a lot uh, that we can rely on each other and our unions 
to collaborate and for each other's support at this time. So it's wonderful to be sharing the panel with you tonight too, Michael. So Jody, when I think about our workers and uh, you know what they do, and you're very familiar with it as well, I, I can't help recently but thinking about uh, personal support workers like Christine Magdagarian and Arlene Reed and Sharon Roberts, who were three SEIU members who died of COVID uh, during the past months. And these three PSWs were women and women of color, which is also an issue that we need to have a conversation about in long-term care. And again, you know, while I mourn for them and their families, I know that Michael too shares the same experience that we lost members through this uh, pandemic. And I will stand firm on the fact that this could have been avoidable. So that is also something that we want to uh, not forget and honor those people and the personal support workers also that were infected through this pandemic. So to paint a picture for you about um, what this period's been like for our members on the front line, I first want to talk about how frontline workers in long-term care have been ringing the alarm bells for decades prior to COVID-19. Um, they've been lobbying the government for decades, uh, all about their precarious work that we know. Uh, it's been certainly spoken about lots that uh, long-term care workers need to have two or three jobs. It's not that many of them want to have two or three jobs. It's because of the, the low wages and the poor benefits, if they even have benefits. So they're trying to seam together many part-time jobs in order to make one full-time living and they are very poorly paid. The lowest paid in the healthcare sector are in long-term care and home care. So they've been ringing the alarm bells for decades. Um, we've been seeing, and we often take this as the silver tsunami coming, and they've been trying to prepare for that. As we know, uh, people are living longer, which is a good thing, but what comes with that is issues like dementia and uh, mobility issues. So the work has definitely become much heavier over the past number of years. And the government has not kept up with those changes. Um, about the levels of care, they're still way back to uh, what was we were seeing in you know the 70s and 90s. I mean, levels of care needed to be increased and we haven't done that. Uh, these workers have been some of the most caring loving people that I have ever had the honor to work with. Uh, workers who work in long-term care, that is their uh, family in there. As you know, long-term care facilities are homes for seniors and those caregivers treat those uh, residents like they're their grandparents, their aunts and uncles. So uh, the care that they are unable to give those residents has been heartbreaking for them through the decades and they have been calling on the government to step it up, uh, that they have to be taking a look at better education as well. So, um, and on-site education as care levels change. And again, we talk about enhancing the levels of care to a minimum of four hours. We need to take a look at the uh, resident to care uh, ratio as well, caregiver ratio. So they've been ringing the alarm bells for quite a while. And recently, as you know, they've been um, labeled as being angels and heroes and courageous, compassionate, caring. Well, they always have been. And they always will be. It's just, it's almost like um, they've come out of the dark through this and, and that can be a good thing. And people, when I say people, I really mean the politicians or healthcare executives. Those people don't understand the skills needed to work in long-term care. And maybe through this COVID crisis, they, their eyes were open. Nurses, personal support workers, cleaners, cooks, these are all hard jobs and they are skilled jobs and we have to recognize that. They have to get the respect and dignity that they deserve to provide this service to the most vulnerable in our society. So to do them well requires, like I said, a good education, ongoing training. And our government um, continues to see these predominantly women in the sector as disposable. And that's what these, these uh, these workers are feeling like they are disposable. At least that's how they feel that they're being treated. So I think the, um, the public really do see now how important the people who look after our families and our loved ones really are. And again, I'm just gonna say they didn't just become heroes during this pandemic, they always were heroes. 
Thank you, Charlene. Um, Michael, I'm going to ask you the same thing. Uh, tell me a little bit about your union, your workers, and uh, what do people misunderstand about the work your members do in long-term care? Absolutely. Uh, um, well, first of all, I'd just like to thank uh, the Hamilton District Labor Council. It's such a privilege to be on a panel um, sponsored by you because you've got such a proud history. We have so many uh, uh, members of your labor council and they're they're so proud of the labor community in Hamilton and all of your all of your long and 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 great history and it's a special privilege to be on a panel with Charlene uh, we bargained together uh, uh, Charlene is uh, an outstanding uh, labor leader probably in the COVID crisis uh, the most prominent labor leader uh, uh, speaking out on behalf of members and healthcare. And, uh, you know, it's been such a privilege, Charlene. Uh, we've been fighting side by side with other unions trying to, trying to protect our members. And it, you know, as you all know, it's not, it's not easy, but we bargained together and, uh, and I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm very, uh, very grateful uh, to know Charlene and to be, uh, to be able to work with her. She's just, just an outstanding labor leader. In terms of what people misunderstand, I think people misunderstand uh, uh, the sense that long-term care is sort of a custodial service for older people when actually in a series of policy moves from the liberal, uh, the NDP government, rather in the 1990s, long-term care was transformed to replace complex continuing care hospitals. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's gradually absorbed all these people with complex medical conditions, cognitive impairments, psychological brain disorders, and uh, there's been no increase in staffing. And as a result, the way they've dealt with that is they've re-engineered the work so that, People are speeding up all the time, able only to meet the most basic needs. It's a horrific environment to work in from uh, the polling that we've done of our members, like um, half of our members, hugely female workforce, uh, have been sexually assaulted in the last year, like half, sexually assaulted, not harassed. Um, of the racialized membership, over 90% are subject to ongoing racial harassment. Um, physically assaulted, again, over, over uh, I think, 75% of our members physically assaulted. This is an environment where the people who are receiving uh, care, the residents and their families are, uh, are distraught because these ongoing cutbacks that happen by transferring people with greater and greater needs with no increase in, in staffing mean that there's less and less time for them. Their needs are frustrated. They strike out, they lash out in different ways. And uh, you know we have an environment here where neither the workers or the people they care for are valued. And if one thing comes out of this crisis, I'm really hoping, first of all, that long-term care workers come out of this as, as all healthcare workers should, with a much better sense of how valued uh, we are by, by the public. Um, and uh, that long-term care workers uh, get some uh, dynamism uh, from all of that public support to push for real conditions. And I'll just end the question, you know, this question of four hours of care, I'm sure you know this, but there was a study done by US Congress and found that if people in long-term care got four hours of care, you could maintain their physical condition. If they got more than that, they might even see an improvement. If they got less, they would deteriorate. That's why we want, that's why we call for four hours of care. It's what's required to simply maintain these people in place. It would be great if we could do better. That should certainly be an outcome. And if we aren't all horrified and sickened by what's gone on in long-term care and by what's been revealed, uh, we have hearts of stone, I think. Thank you, Michael. So what, what has, um, what long-term problems has this pandemic exposed in LTC, would you say? Any, uh, oh. Michael? Sorry, please. Oh. Well, it's definitely, and you know, it's all so simple. You know, the staffing levels are, absolutely will reflect the type of care that you get in these homes. I mean, it's to expect, and during COVID, uh, we, we, like I said, we had a staffing retention and recruitment problem before COVID. Then when this hit, I mean, it was like half of the 
workers were infected, either in quarantine or isolated. So it just, you know, exacerbated the problem where that's the first thing we need to deal with. We should never, ever, ever find ourselves in this position again. We need to have full-time staff in there so that they have the ability to provide care and continuity of care too in that workplace. So the staffing levels are so simple. They have to step it up. And, you know, we say a minimum, and it's unfortunate that we have to say minimum because uh, these, these corporations always go to the minimum. But I think what has definitely come out of the pandemic is that the staffing levels have to be addressed. We have to find ways to keep these professionals in the workplace. So that's the retention issue. And then again, ongoing education in there and two people to a resident. I mean, you know yourself that that doesn't happen often and that puts everybody in danger. So some of the reports that came out, especially from the armed forces as devastating as they were. I mean, that's a result of, and again, I'm. You know, not shy to call it, uh, the profiting in this business as well. That absolutely has to, in my opinion, be gone. Uh, when, and you know, uh, rationing of briefs and uh, rationing of supplies, recently PPEs, it's all about the bottom dollar when they're more concerned about you know, shareholders than ensuring that they pay staff a living wage, give them the benefits that they deserve so that they don't come to work sick. I mean, in this kind of a setting, uh, we should be encouraging people not to come to work when you're sick because of the vulnerable community, but they can't afford it. Again, it all comes down to nobody wants to be at work sick. Nobody wants to have three jobs, but they're forced into doing this full-time work. And again, I would say also is a universal wage rate. I mean, people aren't talking about that either, either, but you know, British Columbia stepped it up. They stepped it up early. They are legislating a universal wage rate that would stop the competition between homes as well. So staffing, treat them with respect and dignity, give them a living wage and encourage them to stay in one workplace. This is like a sweatshop in a real sense, eh? Like, and what COVID reveals here is that, you know, people can get protective equipment, like non-meaningful protective equipment. They've got this highly contagious virus. The workers are restricted to wearing basically the same gowns and masks all day long. Um, you know, people are living in congregate settings. Uh, sometimes people with COVID are put in the same room as people who don't have COVID. Uh, it spreads like wildfire. There's a deliberate policy not to transfer these people to hospital. Like they are denied access to acute care almost universally. Before this pandemic started, people were asked to sign pandemic care plans, which basically restricted them from being transferred. And so as a result, like, we have, by the official numbers, which are like, we believe suppressed, 5,500 healthcare workers in Ontario have got COVID, most of them in long-term care, 15 are dead, most of them in long-term care. And the residents, what is it, 800 have died in long-term care. If you look at other countries in Vietnam, nobody has died. In Hong Kong, not a single long-term care resident has died. In Taiwan, not a single long-term care resident has died. They've approached the problem differently. This is a government and a society that unfortunately has not valued either the people who live in long-term care or the people who work there. And that's got to change, I think. So then who's to blame for the conditions in long-term care? Is it the government? Is it the owners? Like since long-term care became privatized under the Harris government, why has no government have taken any kind of accountability for the decline in, in care for in long-term care? So who, who, are, who are we pointing fingers at? Charlene. Well, yeah, I mean, ultimately the government funds uh, nursing homes. So, and they fund it with our tax dollars. So at the end of the day, and the premier said that in many of his press conferences, you know, the buck stops at him and he's 100% right. They have an obligation to provide dignified care, professional care to seniors of this society and others. It's not just seniors in there either, but that is their responsibility. They need to hold those owners responsible to provide safe care for the residents and for the workers. I mean, it's, it's actually the law. So it does fall with them. But again, that does not put the owners uh, off the hook either. 
I mean, um, when you're not being checked and you're not being held accountable, then of course they're going to, you know, drive everything to the bottom because they're accountable to shareholders and they've got to make a profit. So absolutely, and you can see the differences. And you know, that's one thing that data has shown in this uh, in the last couple of months too, is that the not-for-profit homes have done much better than the for-profits. Municipal homes have done even better than nursing homes. And I'm hoping that if we will, and I'm still going to be screaming for an inquiry, not a commission, that all of that stuff would be com coming out. Like Because homes, there are a lot of homes that did things good, but you watch and see, they're more not-for-profit and the municipal homes. So both are held accountable. It's the employer's responsibility under the law to keep people safe. And that means staffing levels and adequate um, uh, precautionary measures, infection controls, all of that. But ultimately, the buck does stop with the government. Totally agree. I mean, and uh, you know, this government in particular has a lot of connections to the long-term care industry and is now moving, as you can see, to protect them from, uh, from the consequences of the decisions that they've made you know that the globe reported that in march these companies long-term care companies in ontario moved 1.3 billion in profits to their shareholders at the same time that people were dying three quarters of the deaths in long-term care as you know are in for-profit facilities as charlene said the staffing ratios <coughs> are so much higher like almost a quarter higher in the municipal homes um, so the government needs to take responsibility for this um, and they need to be held accountable for this. They, you know, they contracted out this uh, to these operators and now we have to talk about how we transfer these operations over time to the not-for-profit sector and increase the care levels and uh, make, uh, make care better. Yeah, and just on that too, uh, Michael, you bringing up, uh, you know, the the premier's friends uh, being lobbyists. And just recently, uh, the government is saying that they are going to uh, find some kind of a way to um, waive or diminish accountability for these long-term care homes when families are suing them for the deaths of their loved ones. And again, I'm like, well, of course they will, because eventually, like I said, the fault is gonna fall flat on the government. You know, Michael, we were trying to get answers out of the government. We were asking about PPE. We were asking about infection uh, prevention and control measures. And they were, they were not cooperating with us. The guidelines, we kept saying those guidelines are too weak. These employers, these corporations will always go to the minimum of those guidelines. They have to be clear directives given to these places or else you're going to see outrageous outcomes. And that is where we are today. So why are they protecting those homes from being sued? Because it'll fall, follow right up to Queens Park that they and their guidelines were the ones that are responsible for this. Yeah. So, so do these owners, uh, whether it's for the profit or not for profit homes, like, do they have like the right to determine like who gets proper PPE. So say you're not part of a governing body, say you're a PSW because they don't may not feel that they don't have a, a college behind them, that they don't get a like proper, whether it's the N95 mask or proper PPE. So do you have to have a title in order to be, to, in order to get proper PPEs or do the owners can, they can say, well, no, you're just a PSW or no, you work in the kitchen, but only the nurses can because they have a title, they get um, N95 mask or proper PPEs. Uh, I don't know if you want to do that one, Michael. Okay, so, um, well, I mean, that was just a nightmare too from the very beginning when we were trying to find out what the, again, the IPAC was in these homes and uh, what, what was your um, amount of PPE that you had, what kind was it? Uh, and again, they would not tell us a thing. I was encouraging and strongly lobbying these homes to make sure at the very beginning that everybody wear at the minimum a surgical mask. You know, and I said, treat everybody as if they're infected. Like, why not? Like, there's vulnerable people here. Everybody wear a surgical mask. No, we're not doing that. Why aren't you doing it? Because the guidelines are saying we are following the guidelines. We're following the chief medical officer's advice. Well, a few months later, the Minister of Long-Term Care stands up and says, oh, I guess the virus can be spread through asymptomatic people. 
if you had to put those surgical masks on everybody weeks ago, then this, this fire wouldn't have been roaring through your homes. But to your point about did they choose, um, they were hoarding PPEs. There's evidence of that until they were absolutely, and it looks like an outbreak. When our first member died, uh, uh, two of our members that were in long-term care, one of them sat in a sit-in in the um, kitchen with her coworkers, and they refused to go to work unless they had N95 masks. So they got them N95 masks. Unfortunately, Sharon uh, ended up contracting, or maybe she was infected at the time, but only days after she died from COVID. And she was the one sit, sitting with her colleagues in the lunchroom, in a sit-in, refusing to work unless they had N95 masks. Another one doing the same thing. Her family was on TV saying, I watched my mom lobby the manager for PPEs as a personal support worker for N95s. They, after she died, they gave everybody N95s for a day, but then soon they went back to, you know, surgical masks and watered down. And again, like Michael and other unions, we lobbied to um, get more uh, directives in there. And we did end up getting uh, what we call Directive 5, where it did say that um, you know, a, a, a risk assessment done by a registered staff person who would determine that an N95 was necessary. And then we ran into issues there because uh, if a registered staff person identified that, then he or she would get the N95, but yet a personal support worker and a house worker or a housekeeper or dietary person would not. So yeah, we ran into that nightmare too. So at times they did determine who got the proper PPE. You know, there's millions of these masks in Ontario, but because they had a shortage at the beginning, they're so dug in and um, people are still contracting this virus and they're still getting very, very sick and dying because they're not properly protected. And, uh, you know, to give you an example, like in China, uh, they had a rate of infection that paralleled ours and they knew it was not sustainable. So they went to a higher level, which is the airborne precautions. You never see these Chinese healthcare workers who are not completely encased in, they actually use Ebola precautions. And since then, you know, uh, they recruited 42,000 healthcare workers to work in Wuhan, China. Only one got COVID. We've made presentations, Charlene's brought scientists, we brought scientists, we've made presentations to government about the science around how this virus is transmitted and the protections workers need to give, to be given. And they don't ask a single question after we review the literature with them and all the studies, they don't ask anything. Like it's, uh, it's unbelievable, really. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. So can the owners, operators, or the management, can, if there's an active COVID outbreak in the facilities, can they force the workers to continue to go to work or um, whether they provide PPEs or not, but can they force the workers to continue to work? Uh, I'm not so sure for us. I mean, they've done a lot of threatening throughout this and, you know, there's so many different stages to this story that when you, you know, re reflect back, it's like, there's different phases of emotion and frustration through this, but um, they went to the point where, you know, if you came in contact with it, you, you, you know, we were, we were told early that if you were in contact with somebody who was infected, you were supposed to self isolate for 14 days. Um, when they saw that that was going to cause uh, further staffing crisis, the employer started to say, well, unless you're showing symptoms, you shouldn't do that. So come back to work. They did threaten that if they didn't come back to work, they were going to terminate them for abandoning their job. But it got to a point where they couldn't do that anymore because they had nobody to replace them. And then moving forward, uh, when they were tested positive, uh, the guidelines were that you were not to return to work unless you had two negative tests. And again, because of the exacerbated staffing crisis, the employers were saying to workers, um, if you've had one negative test, come back. You don't have to wait until the second test. And that's what we're finding now. They are being so negligent now because of the staffing crisis that they're hiring people that aren't tested before they come in and even management staff. And in homes where there have not been outbreaks before, they now are having outbreaks this late in the game. So, um, you know, would they have the right to, uh, you know, order them to come back to work? A lot of times they tried it, 
Uh, I'm happy to say that a lot of the members stood up to that for whatever reason it was that they did. And of course we filed, you know, many, many, many grievances throughout this too. And then came the orders that you couldn't file grievances during the pandemic because of the emergency orders. So yeah, uh, I, you know, I don't know of anybody who absolutely forced them. They threatened hard enough. And you know what that's like, some people are strong enough to stand up against that. Others aren't, which probably contributed to the spread as well. This is an industry that uses discipline and firing uh, like to such a large extent that it's, you know, pretty much unparalleled. And uh, there, there is a lot of coercion and fear, I think. Yeah, so, and, and we've been hearing that too, that there's a lot of threats um, that especially PSWs are facing um, from, from management. And uh, so what immediate actions then can be implemented to protect and improve the care and dignity of both the resident and the worker? So they're not going, the workers aren't going into the, into the workplace free, you know, afraid, the seniors are not afraid. So what are some immediate actions do you think that can be implemented? Well, I mean, you know, some of the reports that are coming out from the armed forces and from hospitals who are now in there managing so many of these homes, the first thing that they are doing is making sure that there is infection prevention and control measures inside the home. Um, that was really, they were reckless with that. They, you know, um, health and safety committee members weren't meeting. It was just outrageous at the beginning. So that's the first thing. You have to keep workers and residents safe. And I know that there's a lot of testing going on right now, but of course, you know, testing isn't the only answer. It's identifying who's infected, but you have to take a look at, you know, the community and, the, and isolating not only those people, but people that they've been in contact with. And like Michael said earlier, I mean, putting infected residents in with non-infected residents and, and claiming that a, sh a curtain between the two of them was the protection. I mean, all of that was just so outrageous. And in my opinion too, criminal that it contributed to probably many of the deaths because of that. And I know cohort, cohorting in, in a pandemic like this is absolutely what's going to prevent infection and save lives. And I know some of these homes are older, they still have the four person wards, but they should have found a way to keep those people uh, cohorted together and infected and non-infected with um, uh, a, a designated, staff team to take care of those who were infected and keep them separate from non-infected. Some of it is almost like common sense. But again, um, moving forward now, I mean, I absolutely, I'll go back to that. We need an inquiry. We need, uh, you know, an uh, impartial body that takes a look at all of these mistakes. JOD, you've asked us excellent questions. Those are questions that um, an inquiry should ask and should feel free to bring in witnesses, bring in documents, and uh, get some answers to this where a commission won't do that. So that's the very first thing again too, as well as keeping the home safe because we want this to stop. We want workers to come back to work and have confidence that their workplace is safe because right now they have no confidence in the workplace. They have no confidence in the government that their lives are gonna be protected. And don't forget, they also have families at home that they're worried about infecting as well. And we've had a couple of our members who uh, their spouses were infected and died because they brought home the virus and they're living with that as well. So keeping workers safe, um, encouraging them to come back to work means that they have confidence they'll be safe and that they're going to get the respect and dignity, full-time wages, uh, not having to work in more than one workplace and that they can um, be confident that they can stay in that home as long as they want and provide the care that I know is in their hearts and that they want to provide to the residents that they love so dearly. Those, those are, are uh, excellent and, uh, you know, obviously increasing the staffing levels would make a, a huge, a huge difference. And I think, you know, it's time to have a discussion, at least within the labor movement, about the lack of bargaining power and the lack of civil liberties that these people have, these, these workers in long-term care, home care and, and the hospitals. Um, you know, they don't have the same right to refuse unsafe work. So, um, you know, that should bring 
with it. There was a great case in British Columbia where the, the, the courts found that that um, expectation that you don't have the same right to refuse has to be balanced by extraordinary protections by the state to try to take care of you, right? Because you're yielding this liberty. That's not what's happening in Ontario. People are like cannon fodder. Um, and, you know, uh, without the right to strike, their bargaining power is like so limited. And that really manifests itself in situations like this. Like when we try to take advantage in the future, try to get things into collective agreements through the interest arbitration process, that is such a pain. You're walking over broken glass to make these tiny improvements for these workers. You know, uh, like uh, I think in the labor movement, we have to have a discussion, I think about that, about how long we tolerate, um, you know, this situation for these people, because it's, uh, it's not, it's not working, really. Yeah, and we're all very familiar with Bill 124, which was, let me remind people, only a year ago, where the Premier, you know, put a cap on these workers' wages. And yet he stands up publicly and says, oh, they deserve so much more. If I could give it to them out of my pocket. Well, that's the first thing. Get rid of Bill 124 so that we can negotiate with the employers. And again, there should be a universal wage rate for these workers right across the province so that they're not exploited from one home to the other. Definitely. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, remind everybody, uh, any of the participants, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to um, email Jordan or put it through the group chat so we can address them. So we are coming almost to that point where we are gonna open it up to the participants. I do have a couple more questions for Charlene, for you and, and Michael. Um, like through, so like through your conversations and your communications with your workers that you represent, so how have you found them coping like through this particular crisis? Like what's, what's on the ground that you're really hearing is the constant, the same constant issue? Well, Jody, I can tell you, I have literally broke down crying so many times. I'm getting choked up even telling this story over and over again. You know, members calling us and saying, you know, please, I'm afraid for my life. Like, you know, like Michael said, they don't have the right to refuse. And they were, I mean, first and foremost, they are dedicated to their profession. They know that they need to be in there taking care of those people. But at the same time, they should not be worried or you know criticized for wanting to make sure that they were safe first i mean obviously they were not safe and where are we today you know 60 percent of the personal support workers in seiu are off uh, from long-term care they're either sick or they're infected or they've got vulnerable family members that they absolutely are refusing to risk by going to work so i mean without without ensuring their safety, that they could have confidence in going to work, then we're faced with a crisis where we are today. And that's, you know, talking to them. And, and then when they started, when the first one died, you know, and talking to her children and her family and her coworkers and, you know, another, the most recent one who passed away, you know, she had no family members here. Her family lived in New York and, you know, they're trying to arrange funeral arrangements from New York, they can't get here. You know, we help the family with that. And, and it's, you know, the personal uh, impact, the fear. And, you know, I, and then the fear of the virus and they're heartbreaking about not being able to give the care that they want to give to those residents. But then to top it all off, they have to watch them die. They had to watch the body bags leave the place. And then when the funeral homes refused to come in and prepare the bodies, then they were told that you have to prepare the bodies as well. Like, it's just, it was just unbelievable what these people have been through. And again, yes, calling them angels, absolutely. But now, like they are saying to me, action speaks louder than words. So we need to show them that we appreciate them, we heard them, and our eyes have been open. And we as a society does need to ensure that these workers are treated much better because we've proven that they are so important to us and the government during this short period of time has deemed them essential. 
well, they're essential to all of us. And we together, I've got to make sure over the summer before the next wave, but that you and I and people who don't have loved ones in these nursing homes right now, that we don't go away for the summer. We keep our voices loud. We call MPPs, we call the premier, keep emailing so that this doesn't go away. These workers want to provide the care that those residents deserve and we need to stand behind them. So it's been trying and you know, I just want to honor all of them and send lots of love to everyone who's worked in the long-term care sector over this pandemic. I mean, all healthcare workers are essential, but you know, 1800 deaths and how many thousands of colleagues have you seen sick? It's been pretty ugly. Michael, through your um, communications through to, from your workers uh, that you represent, how have they been coping? Well, I mean, just to give you a couple of polling numbers from um, our, uh, our polls of them, 91% uh, are uh, feeling uh, they're suffering from stress, depression, anxiety, insomnia. Uh, because of the COVID situation. Um, half of them are isolating from their families. So they're living in sheds, trailers, basements. They're not seeing their families uh, because they're afraid that they'll pass the virus on, which as Charlene mentioned, has happened, right? Uh, with tragic consequences. Um, so that's their, uh, that's their reality. And of course, they worry because um, they're working with people, as you know, who are extremely frail and vulnerable. And because they're so inadequately protected, uh, they can contract the virus and spread it to their coworkers or to these uh, residents. And um, it's very serious, obviously, for them. So there's a lot of anxiety connected with that. And, um, you know, I just, you know, they're also like um, very uh, frustrated. Um, you know, our, their union, in the case of CUPE, you know, we tell them that they should ask for certain equipment. They ask for it, they're told no. They call in the government, the Ministry of Labor, 243 work refusals, none, zero upheld not one was found to be warranting the higher level of protection. And this is an, an industry where, you know, 5,500 people caught this disease and 15 died. Like, um, you know, it's, it's, we, it's like we marched back in time here and we're somewhere like in the 50s or 60s in terms of how people are being treated and the way the government pretends lies to them that uh, the virus can't be, can't be airborne outside of certain highly specialized procedures. They're not at risk. And so they don't need these protections. And yet they're, they're, they're falling like, like flies, right? Like it's, you know, it's really, uh, there has to be a reckoning for all this. And I've heard Charlene warn the government that there will be a reckoning for this. It's just hard, you know, right now, um, it's just hard to get that reckoning. Thank you. Um, the, my final question from the Labor Council, and uh, before we move on to, there are some questions on the chat, is, uh, Charlene, you kind of already answered it, um, is what are the most immediate actions at the public, doable actions. Not everybody can always feels comfortable writing to their MPs or what are some doable actions, whether it's municipally, provincially, federally, that, uh, that the general public can do? Because we know that once, we, once this comes out of the news cycle in the media, it, 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 all of a sudden it's off the radar. So how do we continue to keep that pressure? Uh, what are some immediate doable actions? Yeah, I mean, that's it. You know that politicians don't like people knocking on their doors. They don't like their uh, email boxes filled. But unfortunately, that's it. I mean, again, I keep saying it takes a village. Every single one of us has got to stay on this message. We have to demand that, again, the inquiry be, uh, be done because, you know, I've been living it and the frontline staff have been living it. 
but many haven't. And uh, that inquiry is critically important to have the truth. And if nothing else, we owe it to the 1,800 families who lost loved ones through this to get to the answers on this. So yeah, I mean, find somebody, some way to do it, call, email, text, but we have to absolutely keep them accountable. And you see, I mean, the government is trying to change the conversation all the time. Let's talk about reopening. Let's, you know, they, they don't like these conversations. And if you ever watch question period, you know, even when they're being drilled by the opposition parties, you know, they they just, they're, they're, they're stiff, they're nervous. They want to get off this subject. Let's not let them off the hot seat. We, we can do better than this. And they are the decision makers that can make this happen. Michael, anything to add to that? I fully agree. Okay, great. So we have some questions um, from the participants. Uh, one of the first questions um, is, uh, it states, I was one of the first PSWs to go to the media regarding the failures in, in my home causing many deaths. What does the whistleblower protection, uh, how does the whistleblower protection protect me? And with the outbreak is, when the outbreak is almost over, but I know they have already fired one person for speaking out. Um, so what protection do, do we have for speaking out about deplorable failures causing death? Uh, well, I mean, you absolutely should have protection. Any worker is protected, uh, you know, under the act when it comes to workplace uh, safety. And that absolutely is uh, for the safety of the people that you take care of. So, but I know I've heard the same stories. Uh, they've even had workers in nursing homes sign documents saying that they uh, agree not to talk about what's going on inside those homes. Uh, but you know, if you yourself feel like you're at risk to, um, to speak out, then you know, call, call your union. I mean, uh, many times we've brought people uh, forward either to media to speak or to the politicians, to MPPs, and you know, they've been they've been either uh, faces have been phased out if they were afraid of that or you know that we've spoken for them we've got testimony there so i mean i know it's it's frightening and some of these employers do retaliate but you know your union's there to help you and i think right now anybody who would retaliate any of these employers that would retaliate uh would be just adding fuel to their own fire right now because they are in a bad situation people have got their eyes on them and you know I, I'm going to continue to demand uh, the for-profit sector gets looked at and that then this inquiry comes there. So um, reach out to your union if you've got it and they will definitely protect you from that. There certainly needs to be whistleblower protection. I mean, there needs to be, even in the area of violence in these, in these homes, uh, you know, people who speak out about violence in healthcare settings and long-term care are subject to reprisal. Um, unbelievable as that might be. So if we're talking about issues that even even more so strike at the heart of like the employer's operations, which is whether they're running a safe facility for the residents as well, um, there's a lot of pressure. And this is an area where the workforce needs more support. They really do. Uh, i just go back. This is a I mean, two of the women that, two, two local leaders that I've worked with in long-term care in the last year have been fired who spoke out around the issue of violence. I mean, we fight for them and we try to look after them to the best we can and we get them back to work. But this is an industry that squeezes people. And this is a workforce that doesn't have the same level of uh, rights and protections that others do. And they're dealing with multinational corporations here, which are very wealthy and very determined and very well connected. And, uh, you know, uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, here, really. So the whistleblower uh, protection is great. I know around the violence issue, the NDP has introduced a bill that includes strengthening whistleblower protections. But as Charlene said, there needs to be whistleblower protections around the whole care issue. Um, because people should have a right to speak up about this stuff. Exactly. Another question is, um, what measures have long-term care homes taken that would ensure that they will not be stricken again if there's a second wave? Have LT uh, long-term cares increased hours to full-time for any part-time workers that cannot work at multiple facilities? Is there, is there still uh, any upcoming plans? That's what the qu uh, question reads. 
Well, I mean, I've been trying to engage the employers on what is your plan if and when there is a second wave. I mean, that's a concern. We don't want to see this repeat. Um, again, we're not getting a whole lot of response from them. Uh, I guess they're where, where they are getting some kind of reports out is with hospital managing it or where the armed forces are in. But I mean, that has been a real problem throughout all of this is that those homes will not communicate with anybody. They don't communicate with the frontline workers. I mean, uh, workers were taking care of uh, positive residents. The employer knew it, but the uh, workers didn't. And, you know, I mean, a day uh, in that kind of a situation is, you know, critical. Uh, as well, they didn't communicate with the family members. Uh, we've been working with uh, family councils on that. I mean, and even, uh, I think Michael said earlier, the reports that they were giving to, um, you know, to uh, public health about the deaths and infections were not accurate. Uh, we were finding out a lot through the media rather than, and as the bargaining agent. So uh, that, again, I'm going to go back to the inquiry, that that would come out into an inquiry and a judge who would be leading an inquiry would put orders in that that has to be uh, one of the outcomes is better communication and there has to be a whole lot more people involved in planning for this possible next wave. But we all need to plan and do something about making sure that this sector is fixed once and for all. You know, in, in another country that was, that probably had zero uh, long-term care residents die, uh, they would take a different approach than we take. They would be testing people religiously. And if anybody showed up positive, they would be sending them to hospital, a specialized facility where they would be cared for. They wouldn't try to pretend that, uh, that their care needs, acute care needs could be met in, in a long-term care facility. And they wouldn't risk uh, you know, exposing people who didn't have it, who were feral and vulnerable, to catching it from people who were cohorted with them in these facilities. Like, I don't see that. I don't see the government moving on that. I see individual hospitals, and I think you've got, you've got uh, some in your area which have taken over these homes, and they've started to move people to hospital. They, they, are, not, they are not treating them uh, in these facilities, but we have a long way to go uh, to give the residents in long-term care the same access to acute care uh, as any other citizen. And that's fundamental to being able to successfully deal with this uh, virus in a long-term care setting, in, in, in our opinion. So we're right near the end of our of our event, and uh, I want to I want to first uh, apologize to anybody that we could not get to all the questions. So hopefully we'll have uh, other events uh, in the in the near future. So Charlene, I just want to thank you for coming on. Michael, I want to thank you for coming on. Um, for taking the time of your busy day to reach out to us. Um, I am gonna throw it back to Malcolm. He's got some final words and I wish you all well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jay. Um, can you hear me all? Am I on, Jordan? Sure are. Okay, thank you very much. Listen, I'd like to thank all the participants and of course our uh, panelists. That was very informative and thank you very much. I'd just like to mention to everybody that uh, the Hamilton District Labor Council has adopted some pretty strong recommendations uh, and resolutions regarding the long-term care crisis. One of them, of course, uh, we've heard tonight, is uh, talking about uh, a judicial review of what's going on. That's what we need. And also another recommendation is about what are some of the more immediate things we have to do to improve the residents and staff for the second wave, which no doubt is going to happen in the very near future, and any future pandemics or epidemics of the flu and so on and so forth. So we've got a lot of work in front of us to do. So I'd like you to uh, keep in contact with the Hamlin District Labor Council. You can meet, uh, join us on Facebook and we, or Twitter. And also we will be putting this on our YouTube uh, channel. And uh, hopefully that uh, we will see you again in future events. Thank you once again to everybody. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you everyone. Take care. Thank you. Good night. Good night.